spiritual formation. And one thing I want to point out, please note on this image, there are two sets of hands. There's big hands and there's little hands. I thought was very profound what we're talking about today. Um, but what do we mean by spiritual formation? There's probably a dozen different definitions or what spiritual formation is. Uh, but the one I want to use is a composite of several different definitions. And it's simply this, that spiritual formation is the Holy Spirit's process of transforming us into the image of Christ, which is key, key phrase, for the sake of others. This isn't just for you. What God does in us, he does in the context of community for community. And very often Christians um, will strive to be like Jesus and, and, and go through spiritual, this process of spiritual formation, but they tend to be kind of insular and self-focused. And that's not the point. We go through this process, we go through the Holy Spirit's process, uh, to transform us for the sake of others. So I want to, I want to unpack this definition. Um, it is the Holy Spirit's process. There we go. I saved a paper by duplex printing, and now I have no idea where I'm <laughs> This process is not ours to control. And this, this may be the most important point. Formation isn't our process. It's not our doing. It's not our goals, but the Holy Spirit's. Our role is whether we cooperate or not. Robert Mulholland says the difference between conforming ourselves and being conformed is the vital issue of Some people really like it. Others of us are like, I would ever do, you know. This is why some people don't like to drink, because they don't like the sense of loss of control. And other of us really like to drink too much because we don't want to be in control. But he goes on to say, in the final analysis, there's nothing we can do to transform ourselves into persons who love and serve as Jesus did, except make ourselves available for God to do that transforming work of grace in our lives. Now, there's no formula for this, right? There are patterns of formation, but no formulas. Um, it requires divine activity. We cannot direct the process, we can only follow. But there's no universal formula to follow. So what is spirituality for me as a, as a, as a retired white man versus what does spirituality look like for an African-American single mother? She's got a whole set of different things on her plate than I have on my plate. So God's going to work in us completely differently. So there's no formula, but there are patterns. It is dependent on our relationship with God. We are designed to be dependent beings. We're designed to be dependent beings. And this is neither an earning nor a performance-based relationship. 
as a species, we were talking about this the other day at dinner with, with sisters and the Dallas. That good German name. Um, that as human beings, we are bound to a meta narrative of earning. From the time we are infants, and I'm watching this in my, my one year old granddaughter, that she knows when she gets positive affirmation when she smiles at us. When she smiles, the whole room lights up, we light up, and everybody loves her, and she knows that. She's a year old and she knows what that means. <laughs> <laughs> she smiles real big. Okay, we earn our parents' approval. Then we go to school, we earn our teachers' approval. And then somewhere along in there, 12, 13, 14, 15, we start to realize my parents don't matter. It's my friends, and we do everything for their approval. And then it's our high school teachers, and then it's our college teachers. And, and so we're bound to this meta-narrative of earning. Especially as it relates to God, we try to follow rules and obey commandments and always do the right thing in order to earn God's approval. This is why it tends to be, interestingly enough, older Christians who become interested and are attracted to spiritual formation because they've been worn out by a lifetime of trying to earn I tell all of you that <laughs> you just get tired. Now, um, page three. Let's page four. You know, like someday we're just going to buy the paper. <laughs> okay. Is spiritual formation. Uh, it's again, it's the Holy Spirit's process. But here's the question Is it a zap or is it a journey? Now, in many regions of Christendom, perhaps especially in the charismatic corners of evangelicalism, where I'm from, okay, I'm a recovering charismatic. Um, our Christian life was based around events. What do I mean by that? Well, based around events where something spiritual or supernatural or emotional happens. So, for example, initial repentance, then water baptism, then baptism of the Holy Spirit, then speaking in tongues, and then a revival experience, and then some sort of spiritual breakthrough. And believers in this kind of Christianity look, uh, long for and look for a zap, some sort of event where the Holy Spirit comes with a zap. And you're like, yay, God moved. Well, what about the other 364 days a year? It's the difference between, we've talked about this before, a light switch where you flip the switch versus a rheostat or a dimmer switch. So I could ask the question, what was Paul's conversion experience? What was it like? It was a zap. He got knocked off his horse, right? Fell to the ground. Well, we think there was a horse. I don't know what it says. <laughs> he fell to the ground at any rate, right? He had this uh, amazing spiritual experience. A voice from heaven spoke to him. What was, in contrast, Peter's salvation experience? Was it when he walked on water and Jesus pulled him up? Was it when he said, You're the Messiah? Was it when Jesus said to him, get behind me, Satan? Was it at the beach after the resurrection? Where he said, Lord, you know I love you. He was a broken man. Where was his salvation experience? I don't know. It was a journey. It was a slow turning on of that dimmer switch. So, um, I would ask you, what's your experience? Are you on a journey or are you looking for a zap? Are you part of a process or are you looking for an event? I'm not saying that events are bad. I'm saying that the Holy Spirit can do both, but the biblical pattern seems to be 
one of a pilgrimage or a journey. Starting clear back with Abraham. What's your expectation? How do you want to change? What's your hope? And our journey with Christ, is it a journey with Christ or is it a journey to Christ? It's easy to conceptualize our life in Christianity as a journey, as a pilgrimage to Christ. But that same life when walked out in an ongoing relationship with Christ, is it a journey to him? Guess what? It's already here. It's a journey with him. So what about transformation? Oh, no, this quote. I love this quote, which again is on a different page. So the process of spiritual formation is a journey that cannot be measured. Sometimes um, change is happening and we're making progress even when we don't feel like it. So this whole quote, absent the, the pictures up in the top corner there, is to give us some spiritual gift we desire, God may have to begin far back in our spirit in regions unbeknownst to us and do much work that we can be aware of only in the results. In the gulf of our unknown being, God works behind our consciousness. And with his holy influence and with his holy presence, he may be approaching our consciousness from behind, coming forward through the regions of our darkness into light, long before we begin to be aware that he's answering our request and has answered it, and he's visiting his child. I love that quote. Because sometimes I feel so um, darn stuck. And I wonder, what the heck is God doing? I <laughs> met with a five-year-old grandson. Says, what the hey? What the hey? You know, and he walks in, he sees something strange. What the hey? And, and that's how I feel sometimes, a lot, actually. What the hey? What's going on, God? Come on. Who said, who said that? Who wrote that? Oh, George McDonald. The quote is from George McDonald. I'm sorry. I had that in my notes, but I think it's there. George McDonald. Okay, let's talk about uh, transforming, transforming us. Transformation um, isn't just about growth and change. It includes those things to be sure. But a dog can grow and change and still be a dog. What transformation is, is about your conversion from one form of life to another form of life. Still a human, but one that expresses the original design in the image of Christ. The Greek word used here is a metamorpho. It means to change into another form. It's where we get the word metamorphosis, right? Like a caterpillar builds the cocoon and transforms into a butterfly. Did you know that they've done all kinds of research and they found that the butterfly is actually present in the caterpillar? The structures that make the wings and the legs and everything are actually in there. But it has to completely break down and come apart in order for those things to be manifest. So it's not just about growth. It's, uh, it isn't just to change behavior or to alter performance or to alter appearance. It isn't external, superficial, or behavioral. It isn't just about growth. Although growth can mean change, as I said before, a little dog grows into a big dog, but it's still a dog, not a cat. What transformation is, is from the inside out. It's where we get the English word uh, metamorphosis. That that kind of comprehensive total change can only be brought about by the Holy Spirit. It is too much for you to take on. I should have heard a great big sigh. <laughs> Too much for you to take on. 
It's not too much for God. It's not too much for the Holy Spirit. It is too much for you. Thank God you won't have to. Okay. <laughs> into in, 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 into the image of Christ. You're wondering, what the heck? Uh, we don't lose our identity. Okay? We actually move into and become the identity we were designed with all along, the image of Christ. Uh, Pastor Duane would argue that that image is already there, already in us, right? Yes, yes. thumbs up. Okay. We are created to be compassionate persons whose relationships are characterized by love and forgiveness. Persons whose lives are a healing, liberating, transforming touch of God's grace upon the world. When all of us are perfectly conformed to the image of Christ, we will not be a group of clones. In fact, we find our unique individuality only to the extent that we are fully conformed to the image of Christ. It's only in Christ that we find our individuality. We become compassionate persons in the infinite variety of models. We love and serve Jesus in unique ways. C.S. Lewis said of Christians that when they are wholly his, they will become more themselves than ever. So, um, this is a decorator crab. Decorator crabs have little, uh, almost like uh, really stiff hairs on their appendages. That are horizontal and they can tuck things under those stiff hairs. And they do this for camouflage. But if you put a decorated crab and you give it red and green beads, it'll tuck them on and it'll become like a Christmas crab. <laughs> um, so this image of Christ, where am I? We're so used to adding another thing, doing another practice. It's though our lives are based on accretion. The in incremental addition of bits and pieces of knowledge and experience and relationships and stuff, not unlike this decorator crap. But the image of Christ isn't something you add on to the outside of your shell. Robert Mulholland describes it this way. Often people have the idea that the image of Christ is something alien to human beings. Something strange that God wants to add to our lives. Uh, something imposed upon us from the outside that doesn't really fit. In reality, however, the image of Christ is the fulfillment of the deepest hungers of the human heart for wholeness. The most real thing about you. The most honest thing about you. Otherwise, you wouldn't be sitting here in this room. I can say that about you. The most real thing about you, you want to know God and want to be like Him. Not just something like that. You know, that's crap. Don't do that. Um, <laughs> now, where does it start? Oh. It starts at the point of our unlikeness. Again, quoting Mohan, if indeed the work of God's formation in us is the process of conforming us to the image of Christ, obviously it's going to take place at a point where we are not yet conformed to his image. But this can be uncomfortable. <laughs> yeah. We would much rather have our spiritual formation focus on those places where we're doing pretty well on our own. How much of our devotional life and our worship are designed simply to affirm for ourselves or others or perhaps even God those areas of our life where we think that we're already well doing, uh, we're, we're well along the way. The process of being conformed to the image of Christ takes place primarily at the points of our unlikeness to Christ's image. God is present to us in the most destructive aspects of our cultural captivity. God is involved with us in the most imprisoning bondage of our brokenness. God meets us in those places of our lives that are the most alienated from God. 
God is there at that point of unlikeness to begin the journey toward a wholeness and fulfillment in Christ. Now, again, on a continuing in unpacking, it is for the sake of others. Jesus summarized the entire law, the entire scriptures, with two statements love God and love your neighbor. When we say that spiritual formation is for the sake of others, we are reflecting that fundamental truth that Jesus said. We are designed and created to be in relationships. Just as God exists in a triune form in relationship with his parts, so we are designed to be in relationships. If spiritual formation is designed or aimed at us alone, we will end up as being selfish, misguided, and ultimately unsatisfying. Our formation is for others, both with the family of faith and those outside the family of faith. Um, think for a moment about our definition in the image of Christ. It is the image of one who gave himself totally, completely, absolutely, unconditionally for others. And that's the direction that the Spirit of God moves us towards wholeness. I'm a teacher. That was my professional job. I was a professor. Okay. I was going to say that another very simple way of saying that is actually experience. Life is a gift. Life is a gift to be given. Yeah. So if God gifted me as a teacher, was that so I could sit in my office and read books? Yes. <laughs> it's so I could teach my students. If you have the gift of mercy, is it so you can sit quietly and be merciful to yourself? No, it's so you can be merciful to others. Whether it's healing, prophesying, preaching, teaching, singing, music, whatever the gift is, you get to enjoy it, but it's not for you. It's for other people. So what about those all those monks and uh, uh, as as saints that uh -huh. live their lives uh, in quiet? Yeah, yeah, we're going to get to that. Okay. Thank you for bringing that up. That's an excellent, excellent question. So. True spiritual formation takes place in the midst of our relationships, not apart from them. We learn to be Christ for others by seeking to be yielded and obedient in the midst of our relationships. Every relationship uh, has the potential of becoming the place of a transforming encounter with God. And every advance in spiritual life has as its necessary and immediate co co corollary in the transformation of our relationships with others. Okay. Let's talk about the history of this. Where did this whole idea come from? The early church. Here's Paul uh, preaching at Mars Hill. In the early church, those who knew Jesus the best had, and had spent the most time with him, discipled and mentored those who joined their number. So the older disciples taught the younger disciples all about what Jesus had taught them. The scriptures, prayer, fasting, times of silence and solitude, just as Jesus had done. They walked with him for three years, 24-7, three years. They observed everything in his life. And then they in turn taught others. People were serious about their Christianity. There were no cultural Christians or casual Christians because it was a persecuted minority sect. You really had to want to be a Christian. Christian spirituality um, was deeply integrated into the believers' lives. There wasn't much separation between the sacred, sacred and the secular. In the first few hundred years of the church, there were church councils to codify doctrine and sort out heresies. But for the most part, 
spirituality was pursued through the spiritual disciplines, not doctrine or dogma. And then, and then, probably the worst thing to happen to Christianity was Constantine. In 313, the Roman Emperor Constantine legitimized Christianity. So suddenly, from being a persecuted and marginalized, albeit spreading sect, it became culturally approved and in fact was brought into the center of cultural and political power. Consequently, <clears throat> consequently, it shallowed out. You didn't have to suffer or be a martyr. It shallowed out. It became just the thing you did. It became culturally acceptable. It became easy and comfortable, and the struggle against the world, the flesh, and the devil waned. But it lost its depth, and there was a separation between the sacred and the secular. People who wanted to be spiritual, this gets to your question, people who wanted to be spiritual were required to lead lives that were radically different from most other Christians. This led to the rise of the early mystics and the desert fathers and mothers, and ultimately to monasticism. So the heart behind the mystics, and I don't know which one this is, but he's in a cave in the desert. He's reading the Bible and notice all the people with him. The desert fathers and mothers, for the most part, lived alone. But the heart behind them was to reclaim the spiritual depths of Christianity that had been shallowed out by Constantine's edicts. There were people who felt the necessity of living a life apart from the world and society in order to embrace the struggle that they felt Christianity was supposed to be. For them, the goal of life in the world is not ease, prosperity, and success, but intimacy with God, maturity of character, and influence in the world. Uh, many of the desert fathers and mothers became so famous that, that disciples would come and build a little hut outside the cave. And then another one would come, then another one would come. And that was how the monastic orders began. And then later, the monastic orders were uh, institutionalized and structured. And though positive in many ways, it ossified the separation between the secular and the um, sacred. Making spirituality something that normal people didn't do because it couldn't be pursued in the secular realm, but rather required separation from the world and from worldly and cultural distractions. However, monasticism carried the knowledge of spirituality through the Dark Ages until the Reformation. So what we understand at home is that sacrilegious to have a photo right over the top of Martin Luther's head? It's okay. okay. <laughs> What we call the modern world was he <laughs> smile on you. What we call the modern world was essentially birthed around 500 years ago when a variety of technologies, notably the, uh, the printing press, uh, all these technologies converged. Newton and Descartes gave us the scientific method and the rationalistic view of the universe. The printing press put the linear, rational, left brain on steroids and pumped up the muscles of critical reasoning, logic, order, and abstract thinking. Science and modernism sought to liberate humanity from the dark ages of superstition and the spiritual of religious dogma. From beginning to end, the modern world has challenged the idea of God and what his role in the universe really is. Um, there it is, Galileo. What happened to him, right? He said, uh, using technology like a telescope, he looked and he said, you know what? I think the earth revolves around the sun, not the sun revolving around the earth, which was against Catholic dogma at the time. And for his uh, inventions and his um, uh, technology and his ideas, he was excommunicated. So the modern mind's enthusiasm for science and technology seems bent on putting God in his place 
but that that place was hugely diminished and considered to be beyond the realm of verifiable and thus irrelevant to the real world. Uh, the modern world assaulted God, shoving him further and further into the corner in its determination to drain all the mystery out of the universe. And um, everything that could be explained scientifically further diminished the realm of the spiritual. And having retreated into a diminishing corner for several hundred years, the North American church culture unfortunately now reflects the materialism and the secularism of the modern world. Uh, world. Now, again, because I'm a recovering evangelical, I got to talk a little bit about evangelicalism and its response to modernism. You recognize these guys? So, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm wondering if one of are not. Oh, is this uh, the school's trial? Yes, Charles Darrow, William James Bryant. That's what it is. Yeah. At the Scopes Monkey Trial. Part of the church's response to modernism is one of two strategies retreat into mysticism and faith, which is what the, uh, the Eastern Orthodox Church and the Eastern Catholic Church have done, and to some degree the, the, uh, the Catholic Church, the West, Western Latin Catholic Church. Um, or the church chose to slug it out head to head with the rationalism and intellectualism of modernity. That's what was happening in the Scopes monkey trial. They were duking it out head to head with the claims of Christianity and the claims of science. Most of fundamental evangelicalism choose, chose to duke it out, but they did so by adopting the framework of modern of modernism's intellectual approach to life. What does that mean? In the church, what that has meant for the last 150 years is that believing the right things became more important than knowing Jesus and reflecting him. Can I repeat that? Believing the right things became more important than knowing Jesus and reflecting. Christians and anyone courting the evangelical vote had to pass certain doctrinal litmus tests. The only absolute requirement for being a Christian was that one believed the proper things about Jesus. The doctrinal struggles of many centuries intensified in their impact by the unusual intertwinings of, with political, legal, and even military power, but at the same time drained it of religious significance and transforming saving faith into mere mental ascent. Well, we talked about this in Theology on Tap. There's a great quote here. Consider this remarkable fact. In the Sermon on the Mount, there's not a single word about what to believe, only words about what to do and how to be. The Sermon on the Mount has no words about belief. It has words about doing and being. By the time the Nicene Creed is written, only three centuries later, there is not a single word in it about what to do and how to be. Only words about what to believe. So Christianity became a thing of mental assent. And our transforming and changing faith became an identity. Can I say a word about the positiveness of the head game? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, you talk a word about that. <laughs> I, 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 yes, that, that's the uh, every every step uh, that the church takes. There's positive and negative. Is that and okay, so let me turn it on. Oh, there we go. All right. And uh, so if you ch trace uh, Christian history and the formation of the creeds, which are, as you said, intellectual doc uh, documents, which appeal to the head, uh, and, and it doesn't say this is what we should do uh, for how to live, live our life, but it was needed. Um, and, and it sort of goes back to what Jesus is saying. It says, 
uh, I and the Father are one. If you have seen me, you know, they say, just show us the Father. And, and Jesus is saying, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And that's, that's not only relational, but that's head stuff. Yeah, to a degree, yeah. And so I, you know, yes, there's always a danger, but there is always a necessity for something like the formulations, the creeds, the doctrines. And I'd like to put in a word my head stuff also about the importance of the mystics. Uh, because the, the mystics really formulated a tradition of introspection um, that I think is, is important now. Sure. Yeah. Uh, and that that looking inward, that that uh, communication with nature that may not have anything to do with uh, people, other people at all. Um, I think had it not been for some of these early mystics, like Hildegard, for example, sure. uh, there, there's a rich tradition that, that I don't think uh, can be dismissed easily in terms right. of the, the formation of a full Christian life that must include not only an outward response, but an inward growth and an inward, even an inward experience. So you know, I, I, I don't disagree with you, but I, I think that that we don't want to give short shrift to those people who spent their life in study. Maybe they were forced to do that because of the historical circumstance, but still in all, that was an important part of uh, uh, the whole formation of the faith through the centuries. And that's what we're going to talk about next week and what the mystics teach us in spiritual practices for how formation occurs. Um, from modernism to post-modernity. David, do you recognize this building? I think it's in Germany. It looks like it's just like a spaceship that's crashed into this old building. Yeah. Uh, Post-modernity as a cultural phenomenon is in essence a pushback and a repudiation of the rational, linear, categorical, and scientific rationalism of the modern era. It is far more synthetical than analytical. It's all about relationships at the scientific, at the quantum level, quantum physics, and at the cultural and communal level. Uh, one writer said, interestingly enough, some believe that the postmodern world, governed by quantum physics with its emphasis on relationship, is actually God's end run around the modern world. <laughs> it's as though God himself is stirring the pot and making things interesting for us who are right on the edge between those two eras, between modernism and postmodernism. Okay, let's move on. <clears throat> Where does spiritual formation fit within the context of other things that Christians do? Okay, um, the modern church adopted uh, an approach to spirituality that mirrors the world's um, educational model. We line people up in, in rows and set them at tables, just like the elementary school. Why are we just in a big circle? Oh, but we follow the pattern of what the world has done. For most of the last 150 years, the purpose of Christian education was to deliver the right content uh, so individuals could have right thinking and thus display right behavior. But 
Spiritual formation is not just about the acquisition of biblical information. Because right content that leads to right thinking, that leads to right behavior, does not equal transformation. It's just right behavior. So, again, continuing, where does it fit? One might ask, is spiritual formation just another word for discipleship? Well, yes and no. To be honest or to be sure, spiritual formation is about discipleship, especially in the oldest traditional and classic sense of the word. But too often, our use of discipleship has been aimed at making believers into good church members for the benefit of the church. We teach them tithing and giving so that they'll give to the church. We teach them to recognize and take advantage of their gifts so their gifts can be used in the church. So discipleship is too often an aim at making better church members for the benefit of the church. Spiritual formation is a broader based, looking more at the kingdom of God beyond the walls of the church and transforming you into Christ's likeness for the sake of the kingdom. Oh, couldn't we have a conversation about what's the difference between the church and the kingdom of God? We're all here in the church. Every Sunday we go to church. All our friends are in the church. Jesus never mentioned the church. Church is used three times, twice by Paul, once by Jesus. But Jesus talked about the kingdom of God continually. We are not the same. Not the same. Forever. Sometimes you don't, you just want to preach. Probably shouldn't be getting rid of the church. Uh, <laughs> uh, I'm sorry, that question is beyond the scope of this morning's conversation. <laughs> okay. Remember, God wants Christians to be transformed into the image of Christ for the world's sake. Our tacit but perhaps unspoken understanding would have us read that definition as for the sake of the church. But the phrase, for the sake of others, would certainly include, but it's not limited to the church. It also includes our families of origin, nuclear families, extended families, and families of choice. It includes the larger kingdom and to the world outside the walls of the church and the boundaries of the kingdom of God. Um, one stop, temper. Okay. 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 Is spiritual formation just another word for sanctification? Uh, yes and no. Certainly, spiritual formation is about sanctification, especially in the oldest traditional sense of the word. Becoming more like Jesus is certainly sanctification in its truest sense. But too often, our use of sanctification, and this is probably more true in the evangelical world than in the Lutheran world, our use of the word sanctification has been solely about dealing with sin and getting sin out of our lives. This is what Dallas Willard has criticized when he calls the gospel the gospel of sin management, where it's just about doing the right thing and not doing the wrong thing. That's not sufficient sanctification. There's a great quote here um, by Rob Bell, where he says, the point of the cross isn't just forgiveness. Forgiveness leads to something much bigger, restoration. God isn't just interested in the covering of our sins. God wants to make us into the people we were originally created to be. It is not just the removal of what's being held against us. It is God pulling us into the people he originally had in mind when he made us. 
This restoration is why Jesus always orients his message around becoming the kind of people who are generous and loving and compassionate. The goal here isn't simply not to sin. Our purpose is to increase the shalom in this world, which is why approaches to Christian faith that deal solely with not sinning always fail. The aim of faith. It's not about what you don't do. The point is becoming more and more the kind of people God had in mind when he first uh, created us. I don't know about you all. I can speak for my wife and myself, perhaps for for the same world. But I found that living a life focused on beautiful to me. Playing a basketball game or a football game and playing not to lose. It's conservative, it's limiting, it's slow, and it's boring, and you inevitably lose anyway. Pay attention. This Thursday, March Madness starts. <laughs> the teams that play to win, the teams that play not to lose, I'm not telling you to watch your TVs for the next two weeks. <laughs> the game must be played to win, not just to lose. This doesn't mean downplaying the importance of sin. To the contrary, it maintains, it, it, it means taking sin seriously, but not more seriously than life and relationship with God. Now, if I use the term, I'm, I'm going to trust you guys to just interrupt me when it's when we have to stop. I think we're people are checking in. Great. So, so shall we stop? Two more minutes. Okay. Two minutes. It's just 1030. How many of you have uh, heard the term quiet time? David? And have you uh, uh, read any? There, there's a whole cottage industry on how to do a quiet time. Do this, follow this process, read these words, write these words, pray, worship, you know, all of that. The performance of a quiet time is, especially among evangelical Christians, everybody has a method that they want to share with you. And the discipline of Bible reading and prayer isn't bad, but there's another way to think about it. Those are just tools, simply means to an end. The end, as uh, Trisha McCary Rose writes in Sacred Chaos, the end is an ongoing relationship with Christ that saturates everything. Our waking and sleeping, our laughing and weeping, our playing and studying and exercising and driving, and yes, our praying. The man who taught me about spiritual formation, his name was Terry Andrews, and he said this, allow the shoulds and oughts and don'ts of a quiet time to soften and blend into this a non-performance-oriented stew of authentic life experiences with God. Allow the rich colors and textures and aroma of this stew to stimulate your appetite for God. Allow his presence to nourish you with all the ingredients of your stewing life, including the formal spiritual disciplines you choose to mix into the pot. And remember, transformation is God's work, not ours. Oh gosh, okay, so... Um, This might be the most important thing I can say this morning. And, and, and then I'll stop here after this. Okay. Spiritual formation in this life is simply recognizing that God comes to you. Oh, skip here. God comes to you disguised as your life. All of your life, every aspect of it. All its ins and outs and ups and downs and failures and successes are the raw materials for the Holy Spirit's use in your transformative process. What if God is most powerfully and clearly to be found in the midst of my messy, broken, exhausting, hurting, and sinful life? I keep thinking I gotta get stuff together so that I can be with God. And he's like, dude, I'm not messy, sticky stuff. 
I'm here with you now. God comes to you disguised as your wife. What if God's most profound lessons for you and the most profound fuel for the fire of your transformation is actually those places where you have not hope of change, where you just completely cannot see God's hand at work? Those places in your life where you've given up hope of ever finding meaning. Yes, right there. In that place, God wants to meet you and love you through the mess transforming you through that struggle into the image of Christ for the sake of the lives. We're going to stop right there for this week. I mean, if there's something that can be done to uh, stop that which keeps us from seeing. Stop that from what? 